Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes. 400 years. The courts have been into R&B. The courts are in the R&B. Years, That's what I said. Love they, they love R&B. They, they, know know the lyrics. they know the lyrics. They can follow the beat. They can follow that beat. Before the year, of course, For 400 the years, years, they've loved R&B. For the they have been beaten and fought. Uh-oh. Oh, Lord have Every mercy. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. I didn't know they loved it that much. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to my people um, because I have some information for my people because I literally need to be honest with all of you. I do videos for my people. Now, some of you don't understand who my people are. My people are not colored folk. My people are not white folks. My people are not brown folks. My people are not blue folks. My people are not green folks. My people are not yellow folks. My people are not those individuals. My people are the ones who have ridden with me, rode with me, hung with me, stayed with me through everything. When they put me on vacation, my people were still there pulling for me, supporting me sending me letters. Man, especially those of you with the Puerto Rico ordeal, ooh, over 400, actually 700 plus letters being returned to sender, never letting me receive those. Just knowing that they were returning them to sender was beneficial. So those are my people. You see, my people support me. They don't support me financially. I don't want their financial support. No, 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 say it ain't so. No, my people hang with me. They trust the information. They verify the information. You know, we always have these people out there talking about fact checking. Let's do some fact checking. Nobody's ever checked me. No, 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 they fact checked me, but nobody's ever come back and said I lied or misrepresented the facts. Let's talk about something, shall we? I I need you guys to, yeah, I can do this. No, I can't. Hold on. I got to show you something. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we filed a lawsuit against uh, this bank and its parent company. Whew. And the lawsuit, the first thing the attorney did is exactly what attorneys do. Came in with that bull, I mean, that stuff talking about, uh, excuse me, Your Honor, we're going to put our motion to dismiss. No, we're not going to respond to the complaint. We're going to go through the rememorug, and we're going to ask you to dismiss this matter. They felt the state of claim whereby relief can be granted. The first thing I do in all of my petitions is I statement of claim these mothers so that we can have no failure to state a claim whereby relief might be granted. Second, we do petitions for redress of grievances. If the law says what the law says, that they have to, have to grant that, then they have to. Now, my people, I told you all that the United States code, because I told them don't F with me. I literally told them that in the complaint, if y'all want to play, I'll play. Because he's going to talk about rules of the court. Well, we're coming under the Seventh Amendment. We're going under common law rules. We don't care about those stupid rules of the court. Now, what's happening is that the courts block you from doing a Seventh Amendment complaint. They block you. They don't allow it. Well, man, I want them to deny me. <laughs> I want them to deny Seventh Amendment. Because I promise you, precedent setting is what this case is supposed to be. So I did it this way. I knew that some idiot was going to deny us the right to Seventh Amendment. I knew that he was going to come in and say all that. Now, first of all, hold on. We're going to read y'all something. Summarization. Okay? We're coming in this in our sui juris capacities, presenting to the court that it should not entertain the stupid defendant's motion. Okay? That it is clear that we are coming in here in our sui juris capacity and have valid and grounded in law, both statutory and common. Now, I'm going to get rid of the statutory, okay? We're going to do 
Wake up. Wake up. Constitutional. As the right to petition for redress is absolute. Comma, this is a right that cannot be denied for the First Amendment makes it quite clear that there cannot be any law or rulemaking as stated in Mulberry v. Madison and in several other Supreme Court case precedents, comma, that no one can convert a right to a privilege, period. It appears that the opposing alleged attorney, for we have no proof that he represents the so-called defendants, and until such proof is placed on the record, comma, his communication cannot be considered, period. But stated again, we have no proof as to any of the allegations or testimony by the alleged attorney who cannot in one point testify and then in another point represent someone in any matter. as stipulated by the Supreme Court in Pagalero. Pagliolero. Pagalero. Stop listening. Give me one second so I can state this end to this stupid thing. We find it interesting that he uses a template found on a program used by most attorneys, comma, bringing up the same case citations, otherwise known as judicial common law, comma, but that common law is contrary to the rules of common law and the right to a common law proceeding under the Seventh Amendment, period, because it is vehemently, is vehemently opposed each the other, comma, we're going to stick with our right to the common law as intended by the Seventh Amendment as members of the posterity of the people who ordained the Constitution in its first instance. Exclamation mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I'm doing this particular video is to show you the following. And as you see, I keep it, as I told him, I was bringing them back to one. Thank you, Brian McKnight. We're going to bring them back to one. We're going to stick to the subject matter. Subject matter is Seventh Amendment common law. We're going to stick to the Seventh Amendment. They're going to try to distract because the attorney and the court work together. Remember, he's an officer of the court. So he comes in and he brings up all of this gobbledygook because he wants us to talk about that junk because he wants to bring up presumption. So we're already challenging presumption. But hold on, hold on, hold on. This is how you hit them in the head. And you got to hit them until you get to the white meat. So we have 65 different instances of the following. We've already placed before this court our challenge to the United States Code with the plethora of errors, either purposeful or otherwise, it is not prima facie evidence of what the law is. The law must be put through what is known as the legislative process, i.e. enacted by Congress, and only certain titles of the code and not the substance of the subsections have ever been enacted in the positive law. Go ahead, I dare anybody to find a single section of the United States Code 
pay attention, not the title, the code, the actual subsections of the title that have been enacted in the positive law. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's let's fact check. You you sure you want to do that? Hold on. Oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, our Eon TV channel that will be available at the beginning of 2025. Okay. I do like the way things have developed. We've changed our color scheme. So we 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 got some stuff coming. Now we're working on a video section. Okay. We are taking care of that. But again, and then we have our chat bots that we're going to be upgrading. And I've already updated Covington Law. So we we got some we we got some stuff to talk about. Y'all know what I'm saying? That that's what I'm talking about. So we got some stuff to talk about, okay? But we will be updating it um, and getting things done. So this is just to let you know so that you get it, okay? And Covington Law, those of you who have ChatGPT, you can utilize Covington Law. Wait, don't tell me. Did he do that? Oh, look at that. He added it. I didn't tell him to do that. He did it, and that's what I needed. I needed speech because I'm so sick and tired of using chats that it doesn't speak back to you. So he did it. I didn't tell him to do it. So thank you. Okay. This because I'm having somebody help me develop this and he doesn't speak English. Okay. Supreme Court of the United States, writ of certiorari. At, a, actual writ of certiorari. Okay. So, oh, we, 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 gonna, we, man, I'm telling you, we, we got this coming. It's coming. And it's here, the battle ram. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, then you also have PDF editing software, converting, merging, compressing. And then we have our tiny URLs. Tiny URLs is going to be free to all of y'all. You want to create a URL if you have to paste and post a URL, it's going to be free. Free, 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 free. And then the song thing, we're going to work that out for you. I uh, Oh, the song I was just playing, hold on. Let's see. For 400 years, a courts have loved beating the faces out of a brother, sister, cousin, mother. For 400 years, the courts have protected each other. That was done here. Okay, let me show you something. I, I tried one, two, three, four, five. That was the sixth one. Now, hold on now. Let me make sure y'all understand. There are some. Like it says, it's supposed to be for 400 years. It says before the years, oh, before the year. Okay, I didn't get a chance to proofread that and correct it because I like the way that was done that I said, I'm going to leave it alone. I ain't touching it because I'm one of those who people who believe in genuine. That was done that way and going back and redoing it will change the rhythm, change the beat. Okay. I liked that one. So that's what the Eon channel produces. Yay! Okay. But we said we're going to get to proving something to you. Wake up. Positive law title. Stop listening. I want you all to pay attention because some people don't get this. They talk about positive law. There is no such thing as positive law. Go ahead. I dare you to find something in law called positive law. It is called positive law title. It is a legal term. It's not a word. It's a term. Positive law title. That's how they've been getting over on everybody. They only made the title positive law. Why? Because they knew the idiots in the Law Revision Council were changing things, were adding things. Hold on. Pay attention. A positive law title of the code. Pay attention. Only the title, not the code itself, of the code is a title that has been enacted as a statute. Just the title, people. Title 18, Title 26, Title 11, Title this, Title that. Only the title 
has been enacted in the positive law. The enact, uh, to enact the title, a positive law codification bill is introduced in Congress. The bill repeals existing laws, pay attention, on a certain subject and restates those laws in a new form, a positive law title of the code. Sorry, the bill cannot repeal existing so-called laws and pay attention because the bill is not the code. Huh? The code is not written by Congress. Pay attention, the codification is not written by Congress. It is introduced in Congress. Okay, let me see if we can explain this. Uh, Title 42, a positive law, nobody cares. Positive law codification. Let's go to Congress. Let's see what they have to say, just so people can understand. Positive law codification by the Office of Law Revision Council is a process of preparing and enacting a codification bill to restate existing laws as a positive law title of the United States Code. Restatement conforms to the policies, intent, and purpose of Congress in the original enactment. Well, if it was to conform to that, then why isn't Congress doing this? But the organizational structure of the law is improved, obsolete provisions are eliminated, or ambiguous provisions are clarified, inconsistent provisions are resolved, and technical errors are corrected. Excuse me? Are you telling me that the original laws were ambiguous? That they had all kind of errors? And that they were inconsistent? So you're telling me that none of that junk is law? I didn't say it. Now, hold on. The code is divided into titles. Really? Hold on now. According to subject matter, some are called positive law titles. Just the titles, not the code. The code is not enacted into law, only the title. The code is divided into titles. Pay attention. The code is not law. The titles and the rest are called non positive law titles. A positive law title of the code is itself a federal statute. Huh? Just a title? You all need to pay attention. It is no such thing as positive law. It is positive law title. Now, hold on. The term positive law has long been established, meaning in, has a long established meaning in legal philosophy, not in law, legal philosophy, but has a narrower meaning when it comes to titles of the code because it is positive law title, not positive law. Positive law is just a philosophy. Check out my philosophy. Okay? It's a philosophy. It's a philosophy. Try saying that backwards. Philosophy, uh, it's. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, so that you know, appearing in a positive law title has Congress's authoritative impetus with respect to the wording of the statute. Statutory text appearing in a positive law title. See, statutory text appearing in a positive law title. Congress did not enact the statutory text. Okay? Statutory text appearing in a positive law title is the text of the statute and is presumably, it's a presumption identical to the statutory text appearing in the statutes at large. Say what? So give me, I, I got to, Lord have mercy, I got to pull this right here. Whew. Lord have mercy, I got to pull that. This coming straight from the Law Revision Council 
it's right there at the U.S. Code Office of the Law Revision Council. They run this website. Not and they they claim to be government. They are not government people. They are a private corporation, group of lawyers. The U.S. Code is not law. I told them, leave me alone. They said, mother, and I said, mother, yo, mo and they said, okay. And I said, no, it ain't okay just yet. Just wait and see. And they said, oh, we're going to wait, all right. And so now they're going to see. We're going to take this. Sorry, I'm actually glad that I'm talking with you guys because had I not been talking with you guys, I probably would not have added this positive law title junk. I probably would not have added this junk because I don't like it. I think it's junk. I think it's bull. I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, y'all know what I'm saying. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? Give me one second to paste that, do that, and then we're going to shrink this because it's shrink wrap. And then we're going to do that right there so that they'll have their link. And then we pay attention. I want y'all to pay attention. <laughs> 28 USC. Now, do y'all know what 28 USC is? It's the Judiciary Act. They they claim they amended the Judiciary Act, Article 3. 28 USC is supposed to be Article 3. I know, I know, I know. You didn't know. Well, read it. Statute at large, Act of September 24th, 1789. This is Article 3, people. What, y'all don't understand what the September 24th Act, uh, first stat, 73? Let's prove it to y'all, since some of y'all don't understand what the Article 3 is. Remember, Article 3 has to be a statute at large. Pay attention. The Judiciary Act of 1789, officially titled An Act to Establish the Judicial Courts of the United States, Article 3, was signed into law by President Washington George on September 24, 1789, Article 3 of the Constitution established the Supreme Court, but left Congress the authority to create lower courts as needed. Actually, it didn't. It did not give Congress the authority to establish other Article 3 courts. There is only one Article 3 court in the United States. Would y'all like me to prove that? There is only one Article 3 court in the United States. Would you like me to prove that? Okay, let's prove it. <sighs> let's see. Wake up. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. Stop listening. Now, I want y'all to pay attention. Article 3, Section 1 states, that the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court. Okay, pay attention. So once they established the Supreme Court, that was judicial branch of government. Pay attention. Once they established the Supreme Court, the judicial branch of government was established. Guess what Congress couldn't do at this point? Well, there's a delegation of authority and separation of powers provisions of the Constitution. So when it says, and conjunction, junction, watch your function. I'm gonna get you there if you, they weren't careful, ladies and gentlemen. And is a conjunction. And in such inferior courts, as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. See, the Constitution doesn't establish them. The Constitution established the Supreme Court. The Constitution didn't establish these, pay attention, inferior courts they're inferior they are inferior to the supreme court so they cannot have the same judicial power as the supreme court they're inferior how can they maintain the same power if they are inferior Shh, don't tell nobody don't tell nobody that's why you have two Supreme Courts, the Supreme Court of the United States and the United States Supreme Court. The inferior Supreme Court is the United States Supreme Court. Congress did that with the uh, District Court Act. Uh, give me one second. Wake up.
wake up the district court act stop listening Ladies and gentlemen, District Courts Act. This is not the act that I'm talking about. In 1969, it's too late. I'm doing 1929, 1939. Let's do this. Let's see if we can pull it up that way. Because I found it several times, but that was in research on paper. One, nine, uh, yeah, 1929. Give me one second. Uh, 929 Federal Court, District Court case law. I don't want case law, you morons. I want Congressional Act. Give me one second. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here you go so that you will know. I went to perplexity. I didn't go to chat GPT. What was the significance in the name change from the District Court of the United States to the United States District Court? Now, most people don't even know that it used to be called the District Court of the United States, and it was changed to the United States District Court. I mean, who does that type of research? Who looks into stuff like that? Well, that's what happened, people. The name change of the District Court of the United States, oh, well, I've known this since what? When did I first come across this? 1998? Okay. We're going on 30 years of having stumbled on this, wasn't looking for it precisely. But when I saw it, it stuck with me. The name change of the District Court of the United States to, this was the so-called constitutional court, that, that inferior court that Congress created, but then Congress created another inferior court known as the United States District Court. Why? Because this was the corporation. They received an EIN number. Go look at when Congress got its EIN number. Now, well, hold on. Just to make sure y'all know how to find it. Wake up. Agencies, EIN numbers, comma, withholdings, addresses. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, just going to click on it. It's right there. All you got to do is put agencies withholding addresses. I just decided to put EIN numbers there so that you'll know that it contains the EIN numbers of at least 100 different federal agencies. Letting you know that they are corporations. Corporation, what's your function? Now we're going to go to the House of Representatives. Control F. H-O-U-S-E. Uh-oh, did I get my control F? I don't think it gave me my control F. Control F. All right, got to do that house again. H-O-U-S-E. House. And let's make this bigger so y'all can see. Because y'all can't see that. Whew. We got to go to H. Because, uh, oh, no, we're going to do house of. Of. House of Representatives, okay? House office? No, I don't want no house office. I said house of representatives. Know why y'all playing? There you go. House of Representatives. That's their EIN number. So go do your research on when they got that EIN number. U.S. House of Representatives. See, when you put U.S. in front, that's the corporation. When you put U.S. in front, that's the corporation. Y'all already know this. Y'all already know this, but you need to know. That's why there is a United States Supreme Court and a Supreme Court of the United States. Corporation have EIN numbers. That's the corporation. Pays them attention. Y'all needs to pays them attention. All right, so we got that taken care of. Now you know what you know. Now you know why Congress changed the name. The change helped to standardize naming conventions of the district courts. Wait a minute. Hold on. Why not just make the official name District Court of the United States? That would have done the same thing. Why change it to the United States District Court? See, that explanation doesn't make any sense. This uniform.
uniformity clarify the structure of the federal judiciary, making it easier for the public and legal professionals to understand the hierarchy and the function of these courts. What happened to the District Court of the United States? Well, let me explain to you what happened to the District Court of the United States so that, so that you'll get it. The act that changed the name of the District Court of the United States to the District Court, the United States District Court, was the act of June 25th, 1936. This legislation specifically renamed the court to the District Court of the United States for the District of Columbia and marked a significant reorganization of the judicial structure of the, in that region. Now, this member originally established as the Supreme Court of the District of Columbia in 1863. The court underwent several name changes and structural adjustments over the years, culminating in the current designation adopted in 1948. That was that so-called Title 28 Act. So, ladies and gentlemen, again, as I was stating, it's not who you know. It is what you know. Now, that whole conversation stemmed from me pointing out Title 28, Section 1, and that this was the Judiciary Act of 1789. Okay? I don't know what I know because I'm researching every day. I know what I know because I've already researched it years ago. I hold on to legal information. I don't hold on to personal information and what happened last week and what happened yesterday, I can't hold on to that stuff. I can't retain it. But I can remember law, and I can remember scripture. Okay, but I cannot remember what I did last night, what I did yesterday. Not without seriously thinking about it. Can't tell you what I did last week. And you ask me what I did on May 14th, I don't care how you tell me what day of the week it was. I don't care what other events you told me happened during that day. It ain't happening. Okay. But this stuff, now, ladies and gentlemen, eventually I'll do a simple motion for you guys challenging jurisdiction and challenging the use of U.S. codes. Those of you who are in federal anything, anybody's ever been convicted of a federal crime using one of the U.S. codes, go back in and challenge the jurisdiction of the code. This is 65 different instances. Pay attention. Who gave the Law Revision Council the authority to modify the code? Like the scribes of old, they had to be more Hold on. Wake up. Marticulous. Marticulous. Stop. Stop listening. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, they had to be more meticulous, the scribes of old, to make sure that there was not one iota of a marking and or indicator was absent and or missing and or omitted. These individuals, these groups of attorneys, non-legislative, non-elected officials codifying something and calling it law, impossible, a violation of the First Amendment premise whereby it is perceived that only Congress is authorized to write law, make it an issue, and we make it an issue. So they want to play with me, I want to play back. And we're asking for affirmative relief, y'all. Oh, I apologize. It's supposed to be, oh, I apologize. Um, uh, now I'm going to have to redo this one. It's supposed to be, oh, I apologize, is, isn't is Title 28. So wait a minute. Wake up. Wake up. Oh. Comma. Isn't. Comma. Stop listening. Oh, I apologize. Isn't Title 28 the amendment to the Judiciary Act of 1789? Go figure. I hope that isn't true. Wait a minute. It has to be true. Why? Because Congress 
is only enacted, it's supposed to, has only enacted the title of the code. And the reason why they haven't enacted the remaining titles of the code is because of the inaccuracies is why. So we got to put our hands. So I haven't proofread it yet. I'm, I just did this last night uh, just before I was getting ready to shut everything down and go to sleep. Okay. So this is me. Hold on. Not helping all of you. This is me helping one person. And I want to take this time to let you know what this person did yesterday. He had another case. I had him going to small claims court. He doesn't know anything about the law. He doesn't know anything about court. So I had him going to small claims court and sue the bond of what you call it? Uh, Mid First Bank, Midwest Bank, and uh, Mid First Bank and Midland Bank. Sorry. Both the same company, just subsidiary of one another. And we, the case got dismissed. The case got dismissed. The court said that he was bringing a case in the wrong court because he was bringing a case for stopping the foreclosure. And he told him, I'm not trying to stop a foreclosure, you idiot. I am trying to sue the bond of the insurance company because the, uh, these uh, banks, because they did not follow the law. And I'm filing a claim against their bond. Well, he had a court date. They, they got him to reopen the case by using maxims of law only. That's the case I told you about. The court scheduled it for a hearing. He got his hearing yesterday, but I told him more than just a, over a week and a half ago, you need to communicate with me. If you want my help, you need to communicate. Ladies and gentlemen, I told everybody I didn't do the last minute thing. He had a court date Friday. He called me Thursday after four to talk about his case. And I told him when he called, I said, no, you should have been calling me two, three days ago. Well, I know you're busy on Wednesday. That's right. You know I'm busy on Wednesday, which means you should have called me on Tuesday. You know how I said I don't like surprises. I don't do surprises and I don't do last minute. I told you a month ago that you needed to get with me before the hearing. And I specifically told him two to three days before the hearing, not one day. So when he called me, I told him that, and we discontinued that conversation. Well, I guess I'm just going to have to handle it with the information, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Literally, I don't care. So then the morning of, everybody knew I had a consult at 10. I told him, hey, I got a consult at 10 o'clock. They all heard me say it to somebody because the phone rang during one of our meetings. And I told the person there, hey, you need to call me back before the consult. It starts at 10. So everybody knew I had a consult yesterday at 10. He calls me at 9.56. So no, I ignored his call. Of course, I wasn't going to answer his call at no 9.56. And I wasn't going to text him or anything else because at that point, pay attention. At that point. I have to focus on a person needing a consult. And that consult lasted four hours and 30 minutes. Matter of fact, I'm very impressed with that one. Oh, no, 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 no. The consult goes that long depending on the person and the nature of the information that they need. This person had a unique situation, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to take the time. However, because I take consults very seriously, because people are not paying for advice. They're paying for my time. I give advice all day long. No, they're paying for my time. This is not no technicality. Four hours of my time when I don't have time? I'm seven days a week. I don't take a break. Okay, seven days a week. So they're paying for the time. I have to take away from the other things that I'm doing to help them with their situation. So they're paying for the time. They're not paying for the information. It will always be that way. Information is free. You guys have heard me say that for the last, oh man, now that I think about it, 15 years. Well, technically I've been saying it <laughs> for over 30 years, but be that as it may. So again, let's do this right here. An evidentiary hearing to establish the standing of the defendant's counsel 
and the code and its reliability. We also reserve our right to an evidentiary hearing on someone denying us our right. Um, let's right secured by the Constitution for the United States of America, i.e. the right to petition for redress of grievance and the right to due process and the right to be secure in these rights as they are property or possessions, the right to have the age of the majority, the right to property, the right to life, the right to pursuit of happiness, a common law trial, the right to property, life, pursuit of happiness, a common law trial before a common law jury under common law rules as retained rights and reserved rights and secured rights. Like I said, I'm bringing them back to one. We're gonna, we're in a United States Federal District Court. That's the caption. That's what I put at the top. Um, excuse me, <laughs> District Court of the United States. I don't put United States District Court. Now, okay, they're gonna change it back. I don't care if they change it back. I want it to be on record that I was petitioning the judicial branch. Now, hold on. Remember I told you there is only one Supreme Court with judicial power. Once the Supreme Court was established, and remember, the Supreme Court was established by the Judiciary Act of 1789. The first set of courts, which were circuit courts, were established sometime after that. But the Supreme Court of the United States, once it was established, it was the judicial branch of government. Congress had no authority over that branch of government, nor could Congress create inferior courts. Now, courts, the courts would have to have a hierarchy. One court would have to be above the other in order for people to receive proper redress. That's correct. However, they didn't write the Constitution that way. Congress did not say, and the judicial power will be established upon those inferior courts under the guidance of the Supreme Court. They didn't do that. They should have, but they didn't. And you can't create a statute to create a constitutional right. That's the problem. Like I said, I do a constitution. Someone sent me, young lady sent me a copy of Gagorich, Gagor, whatever his name is. I, a, I didn't like him at first. I didn't know who he was. I didn't like the process for which he was placed in office. But let me tell you something. He gave a speech, a talk, an interview. And when he gave this interview, he spoke as to the Constitution. He spoke as to people's rights. He spoke as to getting back to the basics of the Constitution. And that's what the Supreme Court is focused on. And I told people that's what I liked about the court. They were making constitutional decisions based on constitutional rights and constitutional law. I like the Supreme Court. I like the Roberts Court. I didn't think I was going to like Roberts and his court, but I promise you, out of all the people, it doesn't even matter if they rule against me and choose not to hear anything I say. The things that this court has done to correct a lot of the stupidity is on the money. Okay? They're in line with the Constitution. No, I, no, 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 no. doesn't mean I agree with everything they're doing, please. But the fact that they're sticking to the Constitution Ladies and gentlemen, we have a foundation. As long as they're following that, then we can proceed to the court. We have a basis for which to support our so-called arguments. Without that, we don't have that. Okay, so many of you are afraid of the courts. Many of you are afraid of the back and forth. Why? You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to jump through all these hoops, people. You have to let them know, hey, I have a medical disability. Watch this. Wake up. Let's go here first. Wake up.
Did you know? that the Americans with Disabilities Act qualifies language as a communication disability. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is you.com, not me, but you.com, okay? You.com says, yeah, it, it's a disability. It does recognize various forms of disabilities, including communication disabilities. These disabilities can affect an individual's and how individuals interact and communicate with others, particularly in public and private settings. Communication disability encompasses a range of impairments that affect individuals' ability to convey and receive information. This includes individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing, or have speech disabilities. For instance, people who are blind, okay, but we're talking about language. So I, I'm going to do chat GPT because I'm going to be doing codes with you. That's why I got you. Okay. I got you, babe. Okay. We're going to go to ChatGPT. Wake up. Did you know that under the, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, comma, that Language is considered a communication disability. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, I got to quickly refresh this because it wants me to sign in again. I don't want to sign in. See, give me a second for me to take care of this. I apologize for that. I just decided to open up another GPT that's already connected. I'm already signed in. The American Disabilities Act communication refer to impairments that affect an individual's ability to communicate, to understand, speak, or write language. For example, someone with aphasia, such as myself, I have aphasia, a condition that affects language comprehension and expression or someone with a hearing impairment can impact their ability to process spoken language could be protected under the ADA. The ADA requires reasonable accommodations to be provided individuals with communication disabilities to ensure. Now watch this. I don't want no more nuances. Wake up. Wake up. I don't want any more nuances or clarifications. Just answer my questions directly. Exclamation mark. Language is communication. So don't correct me again. Exclamation mark. The fact that the courts use legal terminology and have a legal dictionary that is just as thick as the English dictionary, but yet the legal terminology in the legal dictionary is not the same as the words and meanings and synonyms of the English dictionary, comma, means that legal terminology is a different language, period. And individuals have a right to understand and communicate effectively with the courts. I need you to put together a petition challenging the use of legal terminology and not providing an interpreter and making sure that the courts suspend the rules so that only English is spoken, exclamation mark. You're going to provide seven Supreme Court precedents omitting case citations as well as 
17 maxims of law supporting the conclusions contained herein. You will not utilize a single United States code, but you will use statute at large in its stead. Is that understood? Question mark. Stop listening. Now, this is going to be the last thing because I've taken you guys to 50 minutes. And let's see what he had to say before we take a look at this. Now, I asked for a motion and wake up. Where's my caption, comma, introduction, comma, table of contents, comma, table of authorities, comma, summarization, comma. Do not sit up here and interfere with my research again. Stop listening. Sorry, he, he's stupid. I understand the level of details you require. Below is the caption and everything, dude, because you, you get on my nerves. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to the top. Sorry, it didn't complete. Notice what it did right here. See, statutes at large, and then pre precedent, uh, pre pre precedent. It, it, it doesn't provide it. Oh no, it's going, we're going to make it redo. But it understands exactly why I did that. You see how I had to just tell it complete? <laughs> so it, it understood exactly what I was saying. And these are the maxims at law. See, no one can suffer. Where's that ambiguity? I just missed it. Oh, there you go. No one can suffer from ambiguity in the law. Legal terminology should not create uncertainty or confusion. All right. And thus, it tells me my presentment. You guys can do the same thing. And then you can add the fact that the code is not law. The code is written in legalese. And you are not required to understand legalese. Okay. Summary of argument continued. Okay. No, 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 no. See, what he just did... Okay, he continued from there. I don't want him to continue from there. Oh, I can't even refresh this. So what I have to do is I have to come up here. And y'all going to have to do the same thing when you're working with chat GPT. You got to come up here and ask the question again. Stop listening. You're going to have to ask the question again. That way he will do it again. All right. Well, thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity of sitting here and putting this together for you. You guys can do the exact same thing. You don't have to go to nobody. All you got to do is go to Google, download a previous case or something where the person won and have it produce a petition for you with the same likelihood. Okay. Now, you notice how right here, uh, stop moving. The law without justice is tyranny. See, it put the maxims there, and then it gives us our legal terminology, our conclusion, our prayer for relief, and blah blah blah. And of course, you have to, you have, you can't just let ChatGPT write everything for you. You have to go and change it around because he makes it seem like you are a wuss. Okay, and you have to unwuss your document. You have to give it some, mm, as opposed to some, <laughs> okay? You don't want that one. You want the, what did I say, mother? Okay, you want that document. All right? Take care of yourselves. Got to go.